Thanks for coming to our talk, everyone. We're super excited to give this for you today. Uh, this talk is Spacecraft, the Care and Keeping of a Legacy Application. I'm Annie. I'm a developer at Initialized Capital, where I work on software that powers investment operations. And hi, I'm Jenny Eller. I'm a developer at Guild Education. We partner with large organizations like Disney, Pepsi, Walmart to provide education as a benefit for their employees. Jenny and I have worked together and apart on several different legacy applications. And despite how people typically describe software as architecture, which feels shiny and perfect and new, we've grown to think about legacy applications as spaceships, hunks of metal hurling through the sky with people inside working hard to keep the thing on course. So today we're gonna to talk about the care and keeping of legacy applications. And we're gonna do that by telling you an allegory. Chapter one, despair. <laughs> In a galaxy not very far away, there lives an astronaut named Yuki. Yuki lives aboard the spaceship Legacy with his team. Most days are good. The team works to complete missions sent to them by mission control. And the spaceship has served them well for a long time. But Yuki can't help but notice that missions are taking longer and longer to complete. The ship, which once felt clean, tidy, and modern, has grown almost unrecognizable. The ship has strange knobs and tubes, the creation of which predated Yuki's time on the ship, and nobody really seems to know what they're for. The exterior of the ship has been patched with one-off fixes, and the interior of the ship is crowded with baggage from team members new and old. The ship's manuals are outdated, and the team's diagnostic tests are painful to run, slow, and certainly not comprehensive. The diagnostic tests take so long to run that the team has started avoiding adding any more, and they run them more rarely. There's even an entire section of the ship that was built by a former uh, co-worker who went on a spacewalk and just never came back. Yuki doesn't go to that part of the ship anymore. It's too confusing over there. And the last time anyone tried to do anything, the ship was inoperable for two days. With the state of the ship, missions are taking longer and longer. Yuki hasn't been able to take a vacation in months. Mission control is starting to lose faith in the team's ability to deliver. The situation feels untenable. Chapter two, the black hole. In times like these, it's easy to look out the window of your ship and daydream. Frustrated by the ship one day, Yuki looks outside and he sees a nice spaceship flying by and he wonders wistfully if they have cold brew on tap over there. <laughs> then Yuki spots something else, a black hole. Yuki has heard of black holes, but this is the first time that the team on the legacy had gotten close enough to feel its enticing gravitational pull. The black hole is the promise of the full rewrite. Yuki has heard of other lead astronauts who drove their ships into the black hole. Sometimes it worked, he's heard, when executed nimbly in exactly the right context. With the state of the ship, Yuki feels the pull of the black hole. What if they threw the spaceship out? They could start from scratch, build enough bedrooms for everyone, fix their launchers, get rid of the mysterious cruft that had gathered on the ship's surface. It would feel so good. But Yuki also knows that the siren song of the black hole disguises the dangers within. If they went that route, it would be, much, it would be easy to leave the team in a much worse state. They had already lost trust with mission control, and going into the black hole would make that worse. To mission control, it would look like they were standing still, not making any progress, even if Yuki communicated with them the best he could. Even worse, their competitor ships were always just a few seconds behind. Pausing or hindering forward progress would mean that their competitor ships would zoom right past. If the ship being a mess is the only reason you wanna sign your team up for a full rewrite, it's probably not the right choice. Yuki pulls his eyes away from the glimmer of the black hole and considers his ship once more. He decides it's time to do something. Chapter three, assessment. To get anywhere, 
you have to know where you're starting from. Yuki fires up the communicator and calls Amanda, a principal astronaut he's worked with in the past, and he explains the situation. She asks him first about their tests. We have some tests, Yuki says, but they're slow, and some of them are flaky, and they're just large portion, portions of the ship that are missing coverage entirely. There are no shortcuts here, Amanda says. You'll need a test suite running reliably to make progress on improving your ship. We have such limited time, though, Yuki laments. We're already behind. We don't have time to go back, fill a bunch of missing tests. Everything is a mess, and it's really hard to know where to begin. You're not alone in this problem. But you can't tackle it all at once. You'll want to assess and benchmark your ship to find the areas that are best worth your attention. This assessment can start with the basics. To judge the state of the diagnostic tests and track your progress over time, you'll want to have a general idea of your code to test ratio and the code co and test coverage. This isn't about absolute measurement, Amanda says. Rather, it helps you judge where you're starting from and know whether your efforts are moving the ship in the right direction. There are lots of different tools that can help assess the starting point, but two easy options for Yuki are rail stats and the simple cub gem. Rail stats is built into Rails and is useful for getting general summary information about an application. When run, it outputs a summary table that includes lines of code, numbers of methods, numbers of classes, and so on. The final line includes a number that we can use as a gut check on the relationship between our lines of code and our tests. This isn't the best tool or the only tool for the job, but it is a quick and convenient way to get a sense of the code to test ratio overall. It's important to note that this metric isn't telling us how well our tests exercise our code or even the quality of our tests. So it's a limited insight, but it is one high level signpost amongst others that can help Yuki gauge his ship. He notices that the code to test ratio is one to 0.2. The team will want to get that closer to one to one. SimpleCov is a coverage analysis tool that comes with some nice reports and visualizations down to specific methods and lines of code. SimpleCov does its best to detect which lines of code were run when the test suite ran. 100% coverage as reported by SimpleCov unfortunately doesn't mean that you've got a perfect test suite, uh, but it is a way to benchmark the coverage and understand where it's lacking with a pretty nice level of detail. These tools can give Yuki an overall sense of the diagnostic testing starting point and the characteristics of the ship. Yuki and Amanda talk for a while, and Yuki comes away with a plan to improve their diagnostic test coverage step by step. First, the team will prioritize fixing the flaky diagnostic tests. In addition to being annoying, the flaky tests have diminished the team's confidence in the test suite. It's been hard to tell what's a flaky test and what's a real failure. It's been hard to build upon an untrustworthy foundation. Yuki and the team will need to pin down exactly which tests in the current suite are flaky. The team will prioritize making time to address the flaky tests so that they have high confidence in the coverage that exists today, even if that coverage is less robust than they'd like. Then the team can start to think about optimizing the existing tests so this, the suite is faster and less frustrating to run. There are lots of methods of attack, but Yuki has decided to start by identifying the 10 slowest tests and diagnosing the source of the bottlenecks. Often, the 10 slowest tests in a suite will represent a hefty chunk of the overall test suite time, giving Yuki an opportunity to find low-hanging fruit to prioritize. By finding the slowest tests in a suite, Yuki can understand whether certain tests are taking disproportionate amounts of time to run. This can be a great way to identify opportunities for immediate performance improvements. After optimizing existing tests, Yuki can then start looking forward and find the best areas to incrementally add high value tests. To find critical areas for coverage, Yuki will focus on two techniques. First, he'll use a tool like Skunk, Plog, Churn, or Code Climate to identify areas of high complexity and high churn. Churn is a measure of change in a system over time. More change, higher churn. Areas with high complexity are harder to understand, 
to work with and to change. Complicated things changing often are important areas to test and can be good targets for refactoring opportunities. Next, Yuki will talk with his team, including mission control and those in support roles. Working together, they'll map the most critical paths and they'll use this information to determine how much of the most important behavior on the ship is untested. The mission critical areas and the areas of high churn and high complexity will be the team's consistent focus. These are the hotspots in the code base. Hotspots are areas that represent great return on investment. Work also tends to concentrate in the hotspots. If the team can commit to writing tests that support their day-to-day -day work, over time, coverage will be added to these hotspots naturally and incrementally. And over time, these high-value areas can be improved. The team doesn't have a mandate or a pressing reason to just go march off and fix everything. They'll need to work with mission control to address the most critical paths when they can, but the larger changes will happen slowly and over time. The team will need to make peace with taking an incremental approach. Chapter four, parts unknown. After talking it out with Amanda, Yuki is feeling better about making improvements to the areas of the ship that the team is familiar with. But he can't help but think about those other, more mysterious parts. That dark corner with all those modules long overlooked. Those components that Carol attached to the ship before she went on her spacewalk and never came back. How does the team start improving the stuff that they don't understand? Carol is long gone and Yuki's not sure who left that dark corner in its current state. These parts of the ship are missing institutional knowledge and without it, how can the team figure out what to do? Yuki decides that he'll separate the unknown parts of the ship into important and not important areas and he'll invest his time in the former. Though no one knows exactly how Carol's components work, by checking the logs, Yuki's also certain that only a small handful of people have ever used them, and they seem completely inactive today. They were last touched three years ago and don't seem to be used in the ship. He puts the components in the not important category. They're confusing, hard to maintain, and not central to the ship's mission. He'll confirm their status with mission control and work on a plan to remove them altogether. Complexity must earn its keep, and these old components are hardly doing that. He's less sure about the pile of modules in that dark corner of the ship. He can see that they appear to be referenced in lots of places, but it's not clear what they do or why they're there. This is where things start to feel a lot hairier. Yuki doesn't want to accidentally collapse a part of the ship. There are people inside, including himself, and that would make for a truly terrible Monday. Yuki is going to have to be much more cautious with these parts. They're clearly important, but it's worrisome that no one knows how they work. Even if they can pretend that these parts don't exist today, there's going to be a day where that's no longer the case. The team will need to face the unknown head on. Chapter five, recovering institutional knowledge. Yuki grabs a notebook, his boba tea and a flashlight, He's anxious, yet ready to investigate those unknown areas of the ship. There's a real fear that touching any of the mysterious modules could launch the ship off track at any moment. As Yuki steps further into the space, he sees a window. It's just a small, unassuming, porthole-sized window, but he wonders how it might be useful. He opens it up, sticks his head out, and he shouts out into the universe, hello! And does anyone know what this thing does? He's hoping an astronaut that's worked on this craft on, in the past might hear him and have some knowledge or context or anything to share. Not a soul answers him. It was worth a shot, but sometimes you are just the last link in the chain. Yuki pulls his head back in and looks around for more clues. To recover institutional knowledge about this part of the ship, Yuki will need to pull together any information he can. Ideally, he'll be able to, to gather context, intentions, and trade-offs that impacted the way that past astronauts built this section. Yuki digs into the chronological journey of this area of the ship by asking, who worked on this? When was that work done? And why was that necessary? What was the intention of the code when it was written? 
And what were the trade-offs and constraints that impacted the project overall? To find the answers to these questions, the team can reference Git history, pull requests, old tickets, and any other kind of artifacts that exist for this work. Context can also be gathered through improving the team's high-level understanding of the system. Yuki thinks it might be useful for the astronauts and the lovely folks from Mission Control to get an overview of what entities and relationships exist within legacy as it stands today. Yuki turns to Rails ERD for this. This Ruby gem uses active record to generate a diagram of how each model relates to others. He proudly hangs this diagram up in the team of space. This will serve as a sort of map for the team and at least get them all using the same domain language. They've been using the term rocket and booster interchangeably, so this should help to clear up some of that confusion. Yuki then imagines the entire room papered in diagrams, maps, and documents outlining common practices for the astronauts on board. He thinks this could be really useful for the next space person that they onboard to help them build a solid foundation and hit the, the ground running. Next to this new map, Yuki hangs a sign-up sheet for the team to volunteer to add to these crucial resources. He encourages each astronaut on board to take ownership of even just a small piece of the legacy. If each member of the team can become a domain expert in a section of the ship, Yuki hopes that the sense of responsibility and ownership will be spread more evenly throughout the team. It's easy to encounter older, frustrating code and face it with judgment. But code is not written in a vacuum. It's the product of the context in which it was produced. Patterns or decisions that might have been in vogue now might be outdated today. Constraints that existed then may not exist now. Understanding that context, the backstory of how the code came to be, gives you an enormous leg up in understanding how something works today. Chapter six, socializing knowledge. In Yuki's quest to recover institutional knowledge about the most confusing parts of the ship, he realizes that he needs to relay his findings to the team as soon as possible and find a permanent place for this information to live in case he ever decides to take a space walk of his own. He wants to ensure that future astronauts can build on his work rather than repeat it. It's his responsibility to organize this information and use it to help inform the team's decision-making going forward. The biggest thing, Yuki realizes, is that to make progress on the ship, they're going to have to treat documentation efforts as first-class work. They need to be capturing more of the why behind the work that they're doing, and they need to make a better effort to share that knowledge with each other. Socializing this information can take a lot of different formats. It can look like pairing, tests, demos, architecture decision records, and even in commit messages that better capture the why behind the work being done. To avoid a bunch of documentation being captured in a wiki and then forgotten about forever, Yuki gets his team together to discuss what context they need to capture and when and how it should be shared and updated. They ask, why is this information important to capture? Does it actually need to be documented? When will it be important to share? How often will it change? And when will we know when it needs an update? For the bulk of documentation, when changes are needed, it should be obvious, like with a failing test, or happen naturally as part of the work, like with a new commit message. Yuki and the team will need to distinguish between documentation that is likely to need to change often and documentation that will need updates less frequently and choose the right format for each. The goal is to arrive at a balanced approach where the whole team has context behind the work being done, documentation is readily accessible, and when it needs to change, it's a natural part of the team's workflow. If documentation had been better preserved in the past, Yuki's journey to recover institutional knowledge would have been much easier or not needed at all. Chapter seven, working as a team. Yuki takes a slow, thoughtful walk and finds himself again staring out the window of the ship. He's not looking at other ships or gazing into the hole the black hole. <laughs> this time, he sees his own reflection in the window. Yuki spent so much time lately dig digging through cosmic particles, documenting and jotting down ideas on how to make the ship better, 
but he hasn't taken the time to think about how they got here in the first place. And how can Yuki ensure that it doesn't happen again? The happiness of his teammates is important now more than ever, and he's committed to retaining his crew on this special spacecraft. An application success or failure is rarely determined solely by the lead engineer on the team. Legacy systems evolve and lapse naturally and on their own once they've been deprioritized enough. Yuki's job now is to make sure that the right folks are on board to prioritize and improve the care and keeping of the legacy. With this in mind, Yuki decides a check-in with mission control is long overdue. He quickly shoots off a message to the general, inviting anyone interested to the daily stand-up with all the astronauts. This should keep the entire crew all on the same page, create a sense of confidence between the business units again, and eventually be a place for a quick feedback cycle with it for everyone involved. This meeting can also serve as a good place for mission control to ask questions to help them better plan and prioritize the commitments on deck for Yuki and team. Yuki get, then gets the team together to establish some new team agreements. Working agreements describe the way a team wants to work together. These, can, these ground rules can be anything from an entire living document to just a few spoken guidelines. Regardless, team agreements establish rules or behaviors that define the way the, best team, the team best collaborates. Not everyone's been on the same radio frequency when it comes to getting code out, and it's important that they all acknowledge the ground rules for any kind of deployment going forward. If there are any problems or failing tests, they agree to power down the engines until things can be patched. The team decides that a minimum of two astronauts should give a thumbs up before the boosters are engaged. And lastly, the team is committed to adding to the test suite with any new code on deck. Yuki and the team had previously agreed to retrospectives, but they haven't had one in a while. The other things just kept coming up. They revisit, re, excuse me, they revisit this agreement, and Yuki draws a large red heart on the 15th of each month of the calendar so that the team recommits to regular retros. It will be a chance for the astronauts and mission control to reflect on what's gone well and what could have gone better in the last 30 days. Yuki's had success with this process in the past and knows the value of building trust among all facets of the enterprise. The team agreements established here and the time spent adhering to them will be a valuable long-term investment for the legacy. From experience, Yuki knows that these will have a positive impact on the team's productivity, distribution of responsibility, and keeping each other accountable. Chapter 8 the sum of all parts. If you're like Yuki, you might find yourself staring out the window of your own ship, overwhelmed at the work left behind by previous astronauts. You might feel stuck. The work ahead will be hard, but rewarding. This work is different than new feature development, but it's important. Some might call it keeping the lights on, but it's more than that. This work is the care and keeping of legacy applications. This work is code stewardship. It's a team commitment to incrementally tidy, to improve, to define and adhere to standards, to trust in each other and in mission control, and to shepherd the code base and shared knowledge through the dark unknown. In Yuki's case, he weighed a rewrite. He committed to incremental improvement. He assessed the code base, getting a baseline understanding of where the team was starting from. He identified areas of high churn and high complexity. He explored lesser known areas of the ship to recover lost institutional knowledge. And he shared that knowledge with others. And he set intentional team agreements so that the team can move forward together in their commitment to incremental improvement. Over time, the team will understand more about how their spaceship operates and will have prioritized meaningful efforts to make it better. New astronauts will find it easier and more enjoyable to join the ship. Steadily, trust with mission control can be rebuilt. And the legacy will be an operable and enjoyable hunk of metal flying through space for many light years to come. And after many years of dreaming, Yuki will finally get that cold brew on tap. 
Thank you all for attending and joining us on this spaceship journey. Uh, Jenny and I would love to hear about your own legacy tales. Yes, thank you so much. Uh -huh.